All right, sorry about that. I want to get started right on time, so it's 11.45. Uh, I want to thank you for being here this morning and joining this session. My name is Hector Linares. I'm a program manager with the Virtual Machine Manager team. Um, I recognize a few faces here, but I'm glad to see uh, a good turnout today. So we're going to talk about storage and um, all the things that we're doing in VMM 2012 RTM around storage integration. So I want to start off first by highlighting our value proposition when it comes to actually managing storage through VMM in an integrated and seamless uh, fashion. First, we, when we started this project, uh, we wanted to really give customers the ability to connect the dots between storage and Hyper-V. We wanted to give you the ability to st uh, provision storage on demand, reducing that friction of getting, getting storage to your Hyper-V environment, getting storage to your virtual machines. And finally, we wanted to give you access to powerful storage automation across a large number of arrays, different APIs, but without having to learn each and every one of them. So you can build value add on top using orchestrator, service manager, operations manager, the full system center suite, and having that all in BMM and PowerShell. And, also, and what, we'll, uh, what I'll also cover today is how this is laying the foundation for our future investments as we look forward to our next release, which is part of the Windows 8 cycle. You know, uh, again, ease of use is a, is, a, is a common theme that we're looking at across the product, but definitely in storage automation. We want to give you breakthrough insight, not only in VMM, but other parts of, the, of System Center. And also continue to give you storage on your terms. Again, going with the private cloud theme, going with the private cloud principles of being able to have everything be done on demand when you need it, how you need it. All right, so I apologize for the interruption. Let me deal with BJ's question here, and I will, um, all right, so he's got a small emergency. Say, BJ, can this wait? I'm in the middle of something. Can this, all right. So we need to retire one of the NetApps sooner than we thought. We're reaching out to everyone who might have date on it. Right, full of, in, so the initiators and host names actually give me nothing because those could be thousands. So the list isn't really helpful. Can you filter? The list for me by on the servers I manage. Of course not. So um, actually, no. What we can do, we can use VMM. So let's um, see if the array is managed by SMIS provider. So let's see. My management tool can discover storage arrays using SMIS. That would be helpful figuring out which hosts and VMs are impacted. All right, so let's, uh, let's do that right now. Let's actually see what's out there and see if we're impacted by this, uh, by this device going down. So what, what, I, what you have here is the VMM console. This is VMM 2012 RTM. I am in what's called the fabric space. So if you look on the bottom left, that's the space that's currently selected. Uh, in, the, in the tree node, what you'll see are three main sections for the fabric. We consider servers, storage, networking part of the fabric. So we're going to focus first on the storage environment. I've got a few arrays that are already managed by, by VMM. So what I'm going to do now is add the storage array that, he, um, that BJ mentioned and see if, uh, if I'm impacted by that storage array going down. So I'm going to type in the name of the provider. So this is the SMIS provider that I'm connecting to that will then talk to the underlying arrays. All right. And I'm, it's already, it's going to have a, an, a, what, what we call a run as account. That's how you connect to the provider. So it's got one array that's already, that's managed by this provider. And I'm going to bring in the pools under management. Now what I do in this screen is select the pool and then give it a classification. So what, what we're going to do now is actually bring in the pools under management. And um, with that, all the LUNs. And the key piece here is what I'm about to show you. So these are the arrays. I'm going to jump over to classification and pools. Now, classification and pools is where the storage pools, in the NetApp terms, as an aggregate, would show up underneath. And underneath that would be the LUNs. Still not interesting, because I, I need to find my VMs. So if you look on the ribbon, there's a show section of the ribbon. And I'm looking at fabric resources. So then what I'm going to do now is switch over to VM view. So this is all my VMs in the environment. All right, and you can notice that one of the columns here is called gold. So basically, this is all of the VMs that would be on gold storage. So if I just type in gold, not golf, but gold. So I see that I have two VMs here that are, uh, sorry, not gold, platinum. So 
so I, I, I type in platinum as the classification, and I just notice that I have no VMs impacted by this storage rate going down. All right, so one crisis averted. Let me, let me talk to, back to Vijay and let him know that everything's fine. All right, so, okay, I got the information I needed. Thanks. Of course, it was quick. It's all integrated into VMM, so no immediate impact. Let me know when the new NetApp array is set up. All right, so let me continue on with the presentation. So the 12 areas, um, and again, this is just the, the, the path that we're going down as part of this presentation. There are 12 key areas that I want to point out. And so we'll start with end-to-end -end mapping. Now, going back to the list of value propositions we were talking about, what, we're, what we are looking at here is that VMM is bringing storage in, not in the context of being a storage resource manager, but of, of being a storage management for Hyper-V. So what we do is we link together the array information that we get through SMIS, we link together the, with the agent information we get from Hyper-V. So in every Hyper-V box, for those that have already deployed VMM, we, get, we install an agent. That agent interrogates the host, and through our database, we're able to make all the connections. So what you saw me do before as part of, um, as part of the demo is basically VMM importing storage and then linking up where the VMs reside on that storage. So this, this actually comes as part of a customer pain point um, when, we were, when we were going out and doing surveys, talking to different customers, is that there's really no visibility in storage. It really becomes tribal knowledge of having to understand how an array is connected to your Hyper-V host, more importantly, how, which of your VMs are actually connected to a particular array. So, you know, you can talk to different people, you can uh, have Excel spreadsheets, you'll have Visio diagrams, you know, you'll have all this information that as soon as you, you write it, it's already outdated, right? Because VMs migrate, things change. So you end up playing a game of Marco Polo, where you got storage guys telling you that I have storage on this side when your VM's on the other side, but you don't know how to actually get to that storage, right? So that's, that's really what we bring together in VMM in giving you that end-to-end -end path and being able to connect the dots, okay? Over time, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go from A, B, C, and D, and we'll fill in the middle. So A through Z and the, the dots in the middle to help you make more sense of what is actually going on in between. So how do we do this? How do we actually get this going? So I'm gonna give, so this is a small, you know, recap in history of what we've been doing in, since the first release of VMM up to the R2 architecture. So we first integrated with VDS hardware providers. How many actually have VDS hardware providers integrated with VMM? Okay, there's a few of you. So um, this, is the, this is how we first got our, got our glimpse into storage. And we did one feature with this, with this which was called SAN transfer. The ability to migrate a VM from one host to another using masking, unmasking, initiator, log on, log off, NPIV vport creation deletion. So I don't know if how many of you have had experience with that, but that's our first storage integration. And, um, you know, that was one part of it, of talking to the array. We got very minimal information. Really, a lot of the value came from the Hyper-V host. We integrate with the VDS software APIs for, for disk manager. When you load up server manager and you look up disk management, that's the service we're talking to. That gives us disks, volumes, LUN, all that information. We then interrogate the iSCSI initiator APIs to give us portals, iSCSI targets, more importantly, the IQN. All right, so we collect that data, we put it in our database. We then go... We then go into the FCHBI APIs. We get uh, information like discover target endpoints. We get a uh, worldwide name, worldwide port name for the, for the actual HBAs. And in the case that you have an MPIV enabled, um, MPIV enabled HBA, we actually get the, NP uh, the V ports. So NPIV, for those that don't know, is N port ID virtualization. The ability to multiplex an HBA with multiple worldwide port names. And so we're actually able to get all those virtual ports bring that back into VMM, and what we end up telling you is that this VM can be transferred from this location to this location without ever transferring over the network. So that, that investment continues in 2012. The, architect, the architecture changes in that we introduce a new service called the Storage Management Service. This service is actually what gives us access to the SMIS providers. And this is the first time that we're actually integrating, this is the first release of VMM, where we're actually integrating with, with storage via SMIS. So uh, everything else stays the same. You know, that we didn't have to change, uh, just fix a few things here and there, but that, that's what actually drops us down to the lower box. So let's look at that component. So um, 
This storage management service is something that we developed proprietary to the VMM team. And uh, we never, we'll never ship it out, out, out of box. It's not meant to be used by, by other uh, by partners or even within System Center. It's, we built it solely for VMM. This service is what actually gives us a, a WMI interface that we can talk to. So we actually talk to already an abstracted interface. And underneath the covers, we've, it's got a module that talks SimXML down to the providers. For the, so the, the protocol that we're using to, that this service is using is called SimXML. And uh, the providers are SMIS-based SAN providers. And those are the ones that actually talk to the arrays. The key piece to note here is that VMM is multiple layers removed from the actual array. Now, that does not mean that it replaces existing storage to, uh, management tools. So if you have a storage administrator creating LUNs and doing all sorts of stuff on his own, that's fine. We'll bring in that information when we refresh uh, the provider. Right? So we actually coexist with this environment. And key piece to note is that that service has a cache. So we don't have to always be pulling heavily to get all the data. We ha we, it does keep a cache. Any, any operation done through us, through VMM, will update the cache immediately. So if you create 100 v, uh, LUNs through, the, through VMM, 100 LUNs are in the cache. If the storage admin creates 100 LUNs outside, you've got to wait for the refresh. So that's an important piece to note as to how, uh, how we pull in information. But every 24 hours, we pull the service. All right, so what do we get? So what we already have, but what we already know from, uh, from the Hyper-V host is uh, HBAs, HBA information, iSCSI information and LUN information. We get all of this data, put it into our database. So that's a good start. Next one, uh, with 2012, now we talk to SMIS providers, we talk to the arrays, and yes, sorry. Yep. So the question is, if you make a change in VMM, how, how fast will it take for the storage admin to see it? So. Us making a change would be immediate on his console, depending on how fast they refresh. For them making a change, 24 hours before we see it. Okay. So if, it, if it's all right, I've got, I do have a lot of content, so I'll, I'll try to finish a little early, and then we can answer the questions then. All right. So um, when we go off and do discovery, we don't actually pull in everything from the array. So uh, we designed this in such a way that we do a level one discovery. Now, for those that are familiar with these terms, I'll, I'll, I'll go through them in detail, um, especially storage groups masking sets, uh, SPCs. That, that's a really key one that we're going to cover in a few slides. So, but the, this is the thing that tells you which LUNs are exposed to which hosts. Okay? Endpoints are the target endpoints on the array. So if you have fiber channel, ISCA, fiber channel Ethernet, uh, sorry, targets on the iSCSI, fiber channel worldwide port names on the array, those are the endpoints that Hyper-V talks to. Uh, we have the hardware IDs, which are the initiators on the Hyper-V host, IQNs and worldwide port names on the HBAs. And finally, pools. So this is the key one. What you saw me do before is that I imported a pool. Now, that's level one. Level two actually takes a longer time because we're pulling in all the LUNs. So depending on the size of the array, you could have thousands, hundreds, hundreds, thousands of LUNs. Well, not hundreds of thousands of LUNs, not, not there yet. But um, it can have a lot of LUNs. So this can take a long time. So we don't want to burden the discovery piece by something that is really a 10, 20, maybe 30 minute operation. So we get all, this, all of this data. So what do we do with it? Basically, uh, we give you a way of being able to walk the line, walk the path from the VM all the way down to the storage. So you start with a service. For those, are you, so for those that are using VMM or know about VMM, do you know what a service is? Is that a VMM service, service templates, all that? Okay. So basically, it's just a collection of VMs that act as, a, as an application. You, you go one level deeper, you see a VM. A VM will have then one or more disks. Here, I'm going to focus on the VHD, so on the left-hand side. VHDs. Uh, VHDs are, there's an in-guest partition that we don't see, but we're really talking about the VHD that sits on a volume. So what kind of volume? Maybe a CSV, right? So it's a shared volume on the Hyper-V host. So from there, then we, we know the volume, we can walk to the logical disk. Again, we're looking at VDS at this point. From the, now, this is, now from here, we make the first link. From VDS, we can actually pull the LUN, which is a, the, the identifier for that, for that disk. That LUN is the first piece of information that we use to then map it to the array. We also use a target information and discovered endpoints. Right? So that actually gives us the link down to the, lo to the logical unit. So I'll have a demo of that in a little bit. But that gives us the link to the logical unit, or the, the LUN, typically referred to as a LUN, uh, on the storage array. We then talk from the logical unit, we then get the storage pool. From the storage pool, we get the array, and we get the provider. 
This is just one example. Um, if you look at my blog on TechNet, I've got other examples of how you can actually walk the path from a fiber channel perspective or iSCSI endpoints where maybe you're not, you don't have any disks, but you have storage zoned to a Hyper-V host. All right. Okay. So storage classification. Um, so when I, when I imported the pool, I gave it a, name, a classification called Platinum. This is at just, a, it's just metadata that, we, that you create in VMM. It's not a construct coming from the storage array. But we basically, what we want to show here is how you express storage. If you express storage as, a, as in terms of speed or an SLA or some guarantees, we want to give you the ability to express that so that when you deploy a VM, you're deploying a VM to gold, silver, bronze. Uh, I've heard the, the, the term cheap and deep. Right? If you have an application that writes a lot of data that you don't really care about getting you know, constantly that just needs to be stored. So there's different ways of expressing that. That's the, thing, that's the piece that we want to expose up to the templates. In the same way that we have logical network abstractions, though, that's what you connect to. So when you deploy a VM in New York to gold and a VM in uh, you know, Japan to gold, you can make sure that it's being deployed to gold. You don't have, there's no guessing game involved. So, what's, so what is a pool? If you're using an EVA, they're called disk groups. If you're using a NetApp filer, um, a NetApp, sorry, NetApp device, it's called an aggregate. Aggregates then have volumes, volumes then have LUNs. In the uh, symmetrics, you're looking at, uh, they, they, these are called pools in symmetrics. All right, so each, 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 um, each console will have a different name, but I just want to give you some examples here of what I'm referring to when I say pool. All right, so what it, what it means to you is that you can actually make sense of what the underlying pool or the, the guarantees of the pool for your end customer. So when you start deploying cloud, uh, private clouds, the customer doesn't have to know about the array. They don't have to know about the specifics. They just have to know that you've allocated to their, to their cloud a gold storage, silver storage, and they know the chargeback behind that. Maybe gold storage is charged back at five or $25 a gig or you know, whatever the, cost, the chargeback model is. All right, so I got another little emergency to deal with here. So. BJ says he has a new array ready. Okay. Excellent. Did you create the LUNs I need? No, I haven't had time to production issues. Darn. All right, so he hasn't created the LUNs that I need. So you know what? Let's just do it ourselves. So no worries. I can unblock myself by using VMM. I just need the SMIS provider info. Okay. Provider sent to you with the all details. All right. So let's, uh, let's actually do that right now. So in this, in this example, I've got a host, H01, which I've provisioned, and it's a part of a cluster, and it has no storage yet. Um, I'm going to connect via iSCSI in this case. So in, I've got no portals. For those that are familiar with the iSCSI initiator properties, there's targets that you have to log into. There's portals that give you the list of targets that are on the, um, on the iSCSI array, and you're, you, know, you get to pick a favorite target. So the point here is that you have to create, an, create a session from your Hyper-V host to the, uh, to the array. So what I'm going to do is actually provision that or uh, onboard that array from VMM. So I'm going to click, uh, so I click on Fabric in my server space, in my server list. I've got cluster three and I've got host 01. So I'm going to right click on that host, drop down to the properties. So on the left hand side, you've got a storage tab. I'm going to click on that. So I've got one disk. That's all, that's all I have right now. And, I, and as you can see, we, we can list also, we know based on lo the initiators logged onto the targets or the zoning information, we know which arrays, if they're managed by us, uh, this host can see. Right now, it doesn't see anything. So I'm actually going to add the, uh, the array. So I have the array under management. Uh, right now, I have no arrays under management. So, what I'm gonna, so in this list, I want to see a particular file called FS2040. So I'm going to cancel out of this. I'm going to drop down to back to storage, I'm going to go to providers. So on the top right, on the top right of the ribbon, I've got what's called add resources. I'm going to go through the same wizard I went before. This time I'm going to add the, a, a different provider. So I give it a computer, I give, I give it the, the either the FQDN, FQDN or NetBIOS name or, I, or IP address. In this case, I'm not going to use an SSL connection, uh, not recommended, but for the purposes of this demo, um, I'll just keep it simple. And I'm going to give it the account that's going to log into this provider. 
So this part you've seen before. And so uh, what this operation will give me is a list of arrays managed by that provider. All right. So I'm going to bring in the pool under management. I'm going to assign it platinum again. And I'm going to hit next, finish. OK, so I'm going to drop to the classification and pools. So you're going to see aggregate zero come up in this list. And so um, you can check under jobs. So on the left-hand side, there's a, there's a space called jobs. And this, up, this operation will, is the one actually bringing in the LUN. So I do want to wait for this to complete before I make, take the next step. Give it a few more seconds. Always a problem with running a live, a live demo. So there we go. So I'm going to click back on the fabric space on the bottom left. I've got aggregate zero imported, and I've got my list of, of, uh, of LUNs. Right, so it's got a whole list that's already been pre-created. Uh, I, I don't need to really uh, deal with those right now. So I'm going to go back to servers. Now what I'm going to do now is actually allocate storage to the host group where those, that host exists. Allocation is a way of telling uh, the servers or the administrators, which pools they should provision storage from. And in the case where you don't want to provision storage on demand, maybe if you pre-create all your 150 gig LUNs, you can actually allocate LUNs individually. So I'm going to right click on all hosts. I'm going to go to properties. On the left hand side, you have another storage tab. This is where you allocate storage. At this point, I'm not unmasking. I'm not taking any array side operation. This is just metadata in VMM. So I'm going to allocate a storage pool. In this case, I'm going to take aggregate zero, which is the one I just imported. I'm going to click Add. From there, I'm going to click OK. So now that pool has been allocated. Now, now let's get some storage exposed to the host. So I'm going to go to H01, right click, and go to Properties. I'm going to drop down to the Storage tab, and I'm going to click Add. What you're going to see now is the FAS2040 SCVMM. That's the array that I wanted to see, and I'm going to hit Create. So what I'm doing in this case is actually um, creating the init uh, going out to Hyper-V, logging on that initiator to that, to, to that uh, target. So I've added the portals. So BMM has added the portals to, uh, to this Hyper-V host. I, am, uh, I was able to discover the targets. And I've clicked back. It takes a few seconds as it's going through. Now I've connected. So if you take this further and you have a 60-node cluster, now, you still have to do this from every node in VMM, but you do it from VMM. You can create persistent sessions manually by specifying initiator IP, the specific target, and through what portal. But you can do that manually, or you can have VMM figure it out by, by subnet. Okay? So now I'm connected to the storage. So I haven't done anything here. I'm at, I, just, I was just refreshing to show you. So I'm going to click back on, on VMM. So now I've got this, this iSCSI array that's been logged on from the Hyper-V host to the target. So I'm good to go on uh, onboarding the array. So I'm going to click OK on that. Now I'm going to right click on the cluster, because basically what I want to do here is add storage to the cluster. So I'm going to go to properties of the cluster. I'm going to click on shared volumes. I want to add a CSV. So there's nothing right now for that, for that cluster. And if I, I'll show you the cluster information. So again, here, no CSVs. All right, so I'm going to, um, there's no LUNs to allocate here in this case. So I'm just going to create one on the fly. So aggregate zero is the one that, that has been allocated. I'm going to give it a name, some size. Granted, 10 gigabytes in a CSV isn't useful, but for demo, it's good enough. So in this case, we're making a synchronous call to the array. We're creating the LUN. We're getting the LUN information. We're refreshing all of our data. And then we're presenting to you the disk that we're about to format. So we're going to, click, we're going to do a quick format so it doesn't take too long. And we're going to hit OK. So you can do more of these. You can do you know, any number that you want here. I'm just going to do one for this case. And I'm going to hit Add, or right, OK. So I'll drop back to H01. So what we're doing here is uh, we, we created the LUN that was a synchronous operation to the array. Now we're reaching out to the cluster APIs. And we're going to go off and, well, first we're going to reach to VDS and the host. We're going to bring the disk online, in, uh, initiate it, create a partition, format the volume. Once we formatted the volume, we're going to talk to cluster APIs. From the cluster APIs, we'll create the cluster disk. Cluster disk will then create the CSV resource. And then uh, you've got your volume one. 
So again, I haven't done anything on the Hyper-V host manually. I click back on BMM, right click, properties, and if I look at my shared volumes, I've got a CSV. Okay, so in a matter of a few clicks, after adding the provider, I'm able to have storage on demand for my private cloud. So you can see, envision this, if you're running out of space and you wanna add more capacity, you can do this on demand. You don't have to have everything pre-created or wait for something to be created for you. All right, so let's uh, tell Vijay that everything's fine. All right, so everything's good there. So what we went through here is allocation and um, allocation and assignment of storage. And that, those are all the steps that we took as part of uh, you know, uh, you know, onboarding the array and uh, getting, uh, getting storage up and running. So th this goes back to the customer, the customer pain points that uh, were expressed through, through TAP and other surveys in that um, the private cloud model over the you know, past two years has gained a lot of interest. And really, storage became a bottleneck. Storage became an area where you, just, you, you could provision VMs in a matter of seconds, but you had to wait hours, days, maybe weeks to get storage provision for you. So um, there's that, and also the, the fact that there was a lack of automation. Customers that wanted to do really advanced, interesting scenarios, taking advantage of the capabilities of the array, of the investment that they made, but it's, it was just difficult for them. So um, you know, we, look, we looked at the survey and we asked them, why don't you do any scripting? 86% of them came back and said, you know what? I don't do any scripting at all. 50% um, said, you know what? I've got too many choices. I'm sorry, I've got no expertise in this area. I simply don't know how to program against all these APIs. I don't have the, the bandwidth. I'm too busy with my own issues of dealing with the environment, applications, and everything else. The other half said, you know what? I might have the expertise. I just have too many APIs. I can spend you know, months doing one call to create LUN across all my arrays, or I spent the same time doing it for one array, and now I have an inconsistent environment where I'm doing automation for one, but not many. The 14%, the brave 14% that, ca that came back and said, you know, we're doing automation, it's to do this. The majority did not want the human error element to be a part of storage provisioning, right? So, the, so there, was, there was also a higher category of customers that were doing advanced operations, but that's really what we want to bring forward and say, you know what, you can do that as well. You can do that as well through EMM. So I showed you allocation of storage. This really, uh, from the host group perspective, when you combine these, uh, we're really looking at assigned and unassigned storage. Again, since VMM knows what masking sets, what storage groups are out there, we know what LUNs have been exposed, we can actually tell you what's been assigned and what hasn't been assigned. We can even tell you that for, for, uh, for hosts, we don't manage. We can't give you the deep, deep, deep details of you know, a SQL cluster or anything, but we can tell you this LUN is already assigned. So we, we won't try to trample on top of that and assign it um, unnecessarily or, or by accident. All right? Okay, so when you need storage, you, start with, you can start with the storage pool. You can create a new LUN, like I did, and maybe populate it with a VHD. You can even create snapshots. Snapshots, are, in this case, are read-write snapshots, not, not for the purposes of, of backup. Another thing you can do is you can create a, a clone or a replica. This is a, something that actually gets hydrated on the array side, takes some time, and then at the end of that operation, you've got a, fully, a, a, a full peer of the, of the original LUN with no parent-child relationship. And from that, you can assign that, you can make it a CSV, or if you want, sorry, or if you want, create other, other snapshots. But we take it a step further. It's not just the array side operations. When you create the LUN, maybe create the snapshot, we'll go off, go to the Hyper-V, bring in a disk, bring, a, bring up the volume, and show, you, uh, show the storage and maybe use it for a VM creation. Maybe you want to pass through disk to your VM, create the LUN, unmask it to the host or cluster, and then just directly, when you go to Hyper-V API, or sorry, VMM API, uh, UI, assign a pass-through disk, physical disk five or six. Um, maybe you have storage, like I did, uh, a cluster like I did before. Create the CSVs, unmask them to the cluster, we bring up the volume, and we do all the cluster, uh, the cluster side work. Okay, so I've got another little problem here. So this is Ryan telling me that he wants a v some VDI sessions, some VDI VMs from the business unit. All right, wow. Wasn't expecting that. So, sudden change in plans. Business unit purchased new offices as part of the build out. They want to go full VDI for all seats. Okay, so what do you need from me? About 10 VMs to start the app team to start testing and validating. All right, so let me see what I can do. Pretty sure, I, pretty sure now that we've got a good handle of the underlying storage, we can do something for him. And he says that he's going to owe me a steak dinner. So that's good. Good for me. 
Um, all right, let's go back to the, my environment here. So uh, let's start with by let's start by actually creating a, a, a VM rapidly. So let me let me break down the components of how we do rapid provisioning using the SAN. In this case, we're going to leverage the SAN capabilities, cloning and snapshot, to rapidly provision a VM. So I'm going to jump down to the library space. In the library space, I am already selected on templates. I've got a template called HAVM template. I'm going to right click on that template. I'm going to go to properties. In the hardware configuration for that template, I'm going to look at the, uh, the disk. This particular disk is a VHD. The key piece to note is that this VHD is already on a SAN. It's already on a dedicated LUN. Okay? So once it's on a dedicated LUN, we get, some, we get some interesting characteristics of that VHD. If you look on, a, on, a, on the far right of the selected template, there's a column called SAN Copy Capable. We're actually able to understand what's underneath the capabilities of the array. Or, sorry, underneath the host connected by, with the array that's connected to it. We're able to figure out if it supports replica, snapshot, um, uh, for doing snapshot and cloning. And then we're able to populate that up if the VHD is dedicated on that LUN. And so we know that the VHD is sand copy capable. Now this template is sand copy capable. So I'm going to right click on this template. I'm going to do uh, create VM. Oops. Not what I wanted. So I'm going to right click and create virtual machine. All right. So this is going to be my MMS demo 01. Click next. For now, I'm going to leave the defaults. Key piece to note is that we're still talking about the same VHD on that library. Again, I'm using the VMM library. That's where my resources always sit. I'm going to hit Next. Now, like I, met, so like I mentioned before with classification, and um, you know, our placement engine has been enhanced to understand when you need to deploy to storage. It can tell you when you want gold storage. It'll find you gold storage. In this case, it understands that you want to, do a rapidly, uh, you want to rapidly provision a VM. And so the list, of, the list of hosts that you see in this list are actually the ones that are SAN copy capable. These are, the, these are the hosts that can actually receive that VHD. So I'm going to click on N2. I, I want to make sure I don't conflict names here. So. All right. So let me go through this again. Apologies for that. All right. So I'm going to pick N2 and hit next. So in this case, I'm provisioning to a cluster. And so we don't even need to give it a path. Uh, we, we'll, we'll actually handle the path to the VM. So we're going to click next. And I'm not going to connect it to any networks right now. And I'll continue with the, with the script, with the, uh, with the wizard. All right. So now I'm creating the VM. And so I want to go to, I want to drop to N2. So what you're going to see here, I already have a VM called O1 that's been pre-created. So in the same way that we were able to do all the clustering resources and everything else when we onboarded the array and created a LUN, we'll do the same thing for VM creation. So in this case, it was an HA VM template, highly available VM template, which means that on a cluster, we'll create it with all the cluster resources attached to it. So right now, we're creating the LUN. We're unmasking it to the, to the particular host. When we unmask it, we'll go off and do all the cluster operations. Let me quickly drop over here to see where this is going. So the new LUN has been created. Let's give it a few more seconds. Basically, when, when, this, when this thing starts blinking and going pretty crazy, that's when you, yeah. That's when you know that we're actually, affected, we're actually talking to the APIs. Don't know why it does this, but it's actually kind of freaky when you're deploying 250 VMs. All right, so um, what you have here is a rapidly provisioned VM in under maybe a minute, two minutes. Okay, but he asked for 10. He asked for 10 VMs. So let's drop back to VMM. And uh, so this will, this will continue. Let me drop out of this. So I mentioned before that the automation that we have in VMM. So I have here a script. Hold on a second. Wrong keyboard. So I have here, I have here a script that's going to uh, run a test case. Um, in fact, let me just tell you what this is. This is the test harness that we've created for all our partners. 
This is a 3,500 line PowerShell script that goes through every bit of functionality scenarios and at scale of everything we do in storage. So every one of the partners that you're going to see that, that are listed ha have gone through or are going through this validation. So that w w when, when you receive the product, it's scalable, it's reliable, and it, it'll, it'll meet your needs. So in this case, I'm just going to fire off this script. I'm actually going to uh, create 10 VMs. So I would, let me just uh, quickly show you what this script can do. So there's a lot of stuff around this script on being able to log errors and, and print out a lot of information. And uh, the key piece here is that when, when we create a VM, uh, we're actually doing it in, in this function. We're creating it to the cluster. And there we go. So that function itself looks like a little bit like this. So I had to make the script big. I hope everybody can see it, uh, but it does require me to scroll a little bit. Basically, we are getting the template. We're validating the template. And uh, we're making sure that the template is highly available because we're going to a cluster. And then we, we can do this for multiple nodes. In this case, we'll do it for one because there's only one in the cluster. And uh, we'll, get the, we'll get the host object. For those that are familiar with commandlets in VMM, I'm using underneath, there's more commandlets underneath, like get scvm host, get scvm cluster, uh, get scvm, get sc template. And um, the, the, really the meat of this is when we drop in into this what's called a VM configuration. So VM configuration is a new object introduced into, um, into VMM. Uh, and this allows us to actually specialize the deployment of the VM. And so we get to you know, specify a computer name that it's going to go to. Placement actually uses to fill in a bunch of variables, a, a lot of data. The key one here is on the virtual disk configurations. If I scroll all the way to the right, we have a deployment option called use SAN. There's use, use SAN, use network, and use, uh, use existing disk on target. Right? In this case, we're directing VMM to say use the SAN for this provisioning. All right, so I'm going to pop out of this. And um, basically, what this script will then do is just loop through 10 times. And uh, we'll do this in parallel. All right, so I'm going to hit um, run. So now this is executing. So let me drop out of this, go back to the VM view. So now we're driving VMM. Through that script, we're actually going to initiate 10 VM operations in parallel using the same capabilities I showed you in the UI. Right? We're going to rapidly provision the VM. We're going to use the SAN for that. And uh, you know, it really depends on the capabilities of the SAN. If it's really efficient at creating snapshots where no new data is required, then you basically have a very efficient deployment of VMs. All right? Again, I will, I will prefix this by saying, or well, not prefix, but I'll, I'll remind you that it's one VM per LUN. Windows 8 gets a lot more exciting with offload data transfer, but we're not there yet um, you know, with time. So you know what? These will run. Let me just tell uh, Ryan that everything is uh, up and running and that we'll, and we'll move forward. I sent you the computer names. All right. Delmonico's, Los Frisco's, and Peter Luger's. For those that are from New York, you know Peter Luger's, so that's going to be my choice. All right. So rapid provisioning. Sand-based creation of VMs using snapshot and clones. Again, this is not sublun cloning. I get, I get the question every time. Is this sublun cloning? Unfortunately not. Uh, we need platform support for that, so that's part of Windows 8. So I would suggest that you look at um, Windows, sorry, not 8, Windows Server 2012, look up the documentation on offloaded data transfer. That's the capability that's going to give us offload data transfer, not, but not in VM in 2012 RTM. Okay? Uh, we can do VM creation to hosts and clusters. And this one's interesting because we actually have customers that um, that do a lot of ephemeral VMs using SAN-based provisioning, where they don't do it to a cluster. For those that have actually automated at scale with clustering, VDS gets a little sensitive when you expose 100, 200, 300 LUNs to a particular host. So what they, especially in clustering, it just, you know, it just can't handle that many LUNs. So um, what they do is actually break up the cluster into maybe two nodes or single nodes. So there's a team out inside of Microsoft called Agile Labs. They have hundreds of hosts with three EMC arrays, and they provision thousands of VMs a week using this capability. So what I didn't show you is the construction of the template. 
we basically take together an OS profile, operating system profile. This is all the settings that you want to have in unattend. Uh, the hardware profile that gives you CPU, memory, and the disk. And uh, finally, again, we're, we're doing the discovery underneath. So we know that this particular VHD is sand copy capable. Run that through the VM template, and you have a, you have a sand copy capable template. Through placement and the new VM wizard, we pick a host. And as part of new provisioning, new VM provisioning, underneath, we go and talk to the array. That's an that's a, that's a, that's a operation that happens in real time. We unmask the LUN. And when the LUN gets exposed, you have a volume, a disk, a VHD, and then, you pre and then you attach that to the VM. So we've done all this work to get the VMs on the SAN. Now let's keep them on the SAN. So we continue to support all of the SAN transfer capabilities that we did with VDS hardware providers. And uh, we do that in, now in 2012. If, you have, if you're upgrading from 2008 or 2 SP1, that will just continue to work. We haven't enhanced VDS hardware providers. So there's no new, inf no new capabilities there. But with the new SMIS providers, we're still able to do these capabilities of masking and unmasking. Some arrays don't actually do masking and masking in a traditional sense. Instead, you have to do log on and log off of the initiator to the target. So you can, you, you know, you can imagine like the HP left hands work this way. Um, in that case, I will, I'll say right now, right at this point, we don't have support for uh, these dynamic SCSI targets, iSCSI targets, and uh, that's something that we're working on for vNext. Um, and then we continue, so that will continue through the VDS hardware provider path and an MPIV vPort creation deletion. Now, for those that have actually deployed with MPIV, this does require a lot of manual work. You have to create the vPorts. You have to do all the zoning. You've got to do all that work before you, BMM even recognizes it. Something we're working on. We'll try to make it better in, in, in a future release. For the array onboarding that I showed you before, uh, and I get this question all the time, do you do this for fiber channel arrays? The answer is no. We have no zoning capabilities in BMM 2012 RTM. So this is only for iSCSI. Again, another area that we're working on. Cluster management, again, we, this is a, going back and, and, and just reiterating, reiterating the ease of use of the product, the ease of use of being able to provision storage on demand, get it into your cluster, and continue working. The last thing you should be worrying about is having self-service users or your private cloud users running out of capacity because you can't get a LUN up and, up and running into your cluster. Now, there's one part of this that's really, really key, is uh, understanding what is an SPC, or a SCSI protocol controller. I'm using the SMIS terminology here, but in, um, you know, in different, for different arrays, there, there's different terms used. So in the EVA console, you'll see something called hosts. Host actually is the one that presents, uh, that presents the, the LUNs to a particular set of ports through the array targets. If you're looking at a NetApp filer, now that is not the view in the, in the, in the, in the UI. I had to redact a bunch of things. So that's all the spacing issues there. But basically, they're called initiated groups. In uh, the e EMC, they're called uh, storage groups. In the Hitachi, I think they're called host groups. They all mean the same thing. They're all a, a, a container or basically a, a list of LUNs, initiator IDs, and target ports. That's how unmasking is, is accomplished. So this, one is, this is the, the key one to, uh, that, we, that I want to work, work through with you, because this will actually have an impact on how your storage array admin sees the masking, uh, masking sets. And I know somebody from EMC here that has been through that experience, you know, so he can definitely s speak to that. And so it's definitely something that is visible to the, to the stand admin. So let's start by defining what is an SPC, a SCSI protocol controller. Again, this is an SMIS term, and every array is going to have it different, so I want to just standardize on SPC. So SPC is a container of the array ports, the initiator ports, Hyper-V in this example, in this in VMM case, and the LUN, the ID for the logical unit. It's just one container, a group of, these, of this information. That's how masking is. So unmasking, you add a LUN to this SPC. You want to mask and hide it from the host, you remove it from this SPC, the LUN, the, 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 the storage volume. All right. So one piece, uh, so the first thing that affects what this grouping looks like is to understand what ports per view scheme the array is using. Now, this is not a configurable setting. This is just architecture in the array. All right, so the key piece to note here is that there's three different types. When you're looking at an all ports per view array, what, what we're basically saying here is, is that an SPC, every SPC that's created will get all of the target ports. So if there's one, two, ten, whatever number there is on the array, and we're looking at the bottom part of the array, all of them get added to the SPC. That's just by default. That's just how it works. The next one is what's called multi-ports multi per view. This actually gives you a lot of flexibility. The first one's really simplicity. 
Create an SPC, you get all the target ports done. This one actually gives you a lot more flexibility when you have multiple ports per view, where you're basically saying you can have one, two, all. Right? So you, you have the flexibility of, 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 of having all of them in there or maybe one of them. So in that case, uh, on the left, I've got two target ports to the SPC, and on the right hand, I have all four. The more traditional view of is called one port per view, where for every SPC, you're limited to having one, one target port in that SPC. Okay? Again, this is just behavior of the array, and there's, really, there's nothing that can be done to change that. That's just how it's architected. So here's some examples of uh, the different arrays that have these different capabilities. Um, you know, I don't know if there's anything, anything special about this list except that this is, you know, we, we are hiding a lot of these complexities. But I put this out there for reference when you have these slides at home and also when you're talking to your storage admin. Okay. Another, a, uh, another detail about the array is a property called hardware ID per view. If you reach back to what I was talking about before, hardware IDs are the hypervisor initiators, IQNs, worldwide port names. So there's two settings for this, true or false. How many hardware IDs can I have in an SPC? In this case, if it's set to true, just one. So on the left-hand side, I've got an example of um, two hosts in my cluster and two initiator ports per, per node in the cluster. I basically end up with four SPCs. It just, it just works this way. And so there's really nothing that, you know, that, can, that changes the behavior. A bad example of that is if you try, if, uh, we try to add two initiator ports to the SPC, it can't be done. Right? Actually, VMM, in VMM, we, will, we can't even do that. The array will come back and, and give us a, an error. So um, if it's set to false, you have the most flexibility because you can add all of the initiator ports from the entire cluster into that SPC, or you can have one. Right? You have the flexibility. So this is the list of arrays. And again, for reference purposes, um, look at, you know, think of the one hardware ID per view when it's true as a more traditional approach. And where you have flexibility, you've got the other list of arrays. Okay. One more setting. Now, this one is VMM configurable. And this is probably going to be the most important one that you take out of this session. Create storage groups per cluster. And I have to emphasize the groups. So in this case, what we're saying is that you're, you're directing or you're, you're, you're indicating to VMM that for this particular array, I need, when you unmask a LUN to a cluster, uh, to a cluster and it's, if it's brand new, if you're creating masking sets brand new, We'll, we'll either try to create one SPC for the entire cluster or one SPC for the node. You can ha if your node, if your Hyper-V node has one, two, or four HBAs or IQ, uh, you know, HBAs, all of them will get added to this SPC per node. Okay? So in one example, if you have create storage groups per cluster, and the easiest example is the most flexible model where you can have all of the initiator ports into the SPC, all of the target ports in the SPC. So you have one. Simplest case. Another one would be if you turn it off, you say false, I want to create storage groups per node. Then we will create two SPCs and add all the initiators per SPC. Now this is where it gets interesting. When you throw in, okay, sorry, b before we get into the, uh, into the, the, the compounding complexities. So um, one thing to note here that if you're, if you're doing uh, one hardware deep, sorry, uh, create storage groups per cluster, there are some arrays that are uh, very, uh, very good and very highly available, and so they do a lot of pre-checks and checks when you do an active operation on the array. So they'll take a long time to do masking on masking. When you do this at scale, certain jobs will time out. And this is, this is just a function of how you know, we're working with the array running at scale. So that's one of those cases where you actually want to turn this so that you create a storage group per cluster, not per node. Some other arrays are really fast at these operations, and so you can you, you have the flexibility of both. Uh, in, I think in beta time frame, we had only certified this on one array just because we, we, you know, that's the amount of testing we could do. At this point, it is not array specific. It, it's not for this particular or this particular one. It's really going to be part of the best practices that I'll talk about that all the partners are producing. OK. So this is a lookup table of when you throw in all the complexities of ports per view and hardware ID per view. OK. So it's so a lookup table that's not, the same, not that interesting. Let's actually put it into a diagram. So we'll start from the easiest case, where you have multi-port per view or, or all ports per view. One hardware ID per view is false. That means I can have multiple initiators for this SPC. So in this case, if I have storage groups per cluster, I have one. Simplest case. Right? If I set it to false, where I want to create storage groups per node, I'll have two. Again, very, really flexible. 
you know, and uh, really, really simple to, so if you, if you have a 16 node cluster, you'll have 16 SPCs, if it's false. If it's true, you'll have one, irrespective of the size. So when you start thinking about Windows Server 2008 and the large cluster sizes, you'll see that obviously the left-hand side is a lot more interesting because it's really easy to, to implement. Okay, now let's uh, change, a little, change a little bit and say, well, one hardware ID, one port per view is the array, so one target initiate, target uh, per SPC, um, but I want to create storage groups per cluster. So as you can see here, the difference is that I have to create two SPCs because I am actually forced to by the array. But the setting is still true because I'm actually creating two of these based for the two of these, and I have the box around it for the cluster, right? So that is uh, that is a distinction here. Once you turn on one hardware, one uh, one port per view, still with one hardware ID per view is false, All right? So these are the two differences. When I turn off storage groups per cluster and I want to be per node, I'm basically multiplying. So I'm creating two per node. So now I'll have four. If you have a 16 node cluster, 32, right? Okay. Let's go through another variation. Multi or all ports per view with one hardware ID per view is true. That means that each SPC can only have one hardware ID from the Hyper-V side. In this case, the, the problem is reversed. Because of the initiators, I am actually forced to create two SPCs per node. So I'll have four. In the 16 node cluster case, I'll have 32. In the 64 node cluster case, I'll have 128. Okay? But still from the array side, I can add all the ports. So I'm okay there. It, really what's not multiplying it is the uh, initiator side. Now, in this case, setting storage groups per cluster per node doesn't matter. Has no, has no, has no bearing on this, because this is always going to be how this has to work. So let's take the, the most complex example, or actually the, the one that's, that blows up the number of SPCs, is if you have one hardware ID per view, where I have one target per SPC, and, sorry, uh, one port per view where I have one target per SPC, and one hardware ID per view is true. Right now, I can, only, I can have only one combination of one target to one initiator, one SPC. This is a two node cluster with four initiators. I've got eight SPCs. 16 node cluster, two initiators per, per node. Do the math, right? Again, this is, this, is good. this is really important to know when you start your conversations with your storage admins because you know, this is the kind of details that they're going to get into because they understand all this. They understand the all ports per view, how masking sets work, and everything else. So this is the kind of language that when you start expressing your scenarios to them, they're not going to understand rapid provisioning using the SAM. What they will understand is if you want to create 250 snapshots and if they have to reserve some space on the pool for 250 snapshots of a certain size if you're doing concurrent operations. That's the kind of stuff that they'll understand. So hopefully what, what I'm trying to bring here is a translation between the scenarios and the underlying storage conversation. So what you saw me do before uh, with the script is that I've, I'm, I'm able to take advantage of the underlying capabilities of the array. Um, sorry, un underlying capabilities of the array by using our commandlets in VMM. And I'm able to do this at scale. So we, when we test with partners, we scale up to 250 VMs for a cluster. And we actually ask partners to go up to 60 node clusters because you know, the cluster gets a little interesting when you have that many, that many VMs being created, especially in parallel. But uh, the key piece here is that rapid provisioning is done at scale. And that's how our partners use it. So the scenarios that I've shown you in the UI, completely accessible through the CLI. But on top of that, we've given you all the, all the primitives that we think are necessary for you to take this to the next level. As you start building your own automation, as you start building your own value add on top, maybe with Orchestrator or Service Manager or whatever, these are, th th this is the kind of power that you can have using the VMM platform. And this set of commandlets, like, you know, as you can see when you have VMware, for example, in Zen, we have the same set of commandlets across VM uh, hypervisors. Same thing here. It's the same set of commandlets to take advantage of the array, um, but through, a, through a, a very simple script. So that test harness that, we sh that I just showed you, that's, we, we actually give the exact same test harness to all partners. A few changes here and there, maybe uh, you know, LUN name can only be 16 characters or 31 to 32, but mo modulo that, it's the same script given across all the partners. So they just have to execute the script and they can do everything that we do in the UI. So I will plug my own session coming up tomorrow on PowerShell. Uh, we're gonna go deeper into VM config, service config, unattend settings, uh, running scripts in a library. So there's a lot of good stuff there. So I don't wanna spend too much time on PowerShell uh, because we do have an entire dedicated session for that. 
this, this slide is important because when you look at Windows Server 2012, they've introduced a bunch of commandlets. So you go and look at the storage management API on uh, TechNet, you'll see all of the WMI classes they've introduced, and for every one of those, there's a PowerShell. So there's gonna be PowerShell at the platform layer. So everything that we can do to, you can do today in VMM will now be enabled and mainstream in Windows Server 2012. And the, and the key piece to note between VMM and, um, uh, you know, I'll cover that in the architecture slide. Okay. So extensive array support. Um, we've been working with partners for the past, I would say, two and a half years on getting SMIS support up and running. And so uh, it's, 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 been, it's been a journey. And so we have done a valid, lot of validation for arrays that we have in our lab, NetApp, EMC, and HP. We've also worked with a lot of partners using a test harness, like Hitachi, Fujitsu, Dell, and Starwin. And there's more, develop, more providers that I can't talk about at this point, but there's more, developer, uh, more providers in development. And so this, this has been an excellent partnership with, our, with, with working with, with partners in being able to do this and do this uh, you know, in a way that uh, will meet the private cloud needs. I do want to make an emphasis on the fact that we're using standards-based storage management. So we've we're working with SMIS 1.3, 1.4 providers. SMIS, I, I don't think I defined it before, is a storage management initiative specification. It's, it's part of a standards group under SNEA, and uh, they're the ones that produce the spec. All right, so every partner that we're working with, if they have a 1.3, 1.4 provider, we want to work, we work with them, we try to figure out if it, if it meets our needs, and then you know, we, we, we go through that iterative process. Uh, we've been attending, plug, so VMM team has been attending the Plug Fest at Colorado Springs for the past year and a half. I think we've been at the last eight or nine. And so that's a great opportunity that we've had to work with partners directly, where we all sit in a big room and uh, we, just, we just work out the spec, we work out the implementation, uh, we work through our scenarios, and we actually come out after four days, we get a lot done. And one, thing that, one of the biggest accomplishments that we have is that we're able to actually affect the spec. Right? So one, of, uh, one thing that the spec is not is static. It really depends on the clients and the implementers actually leveraging the spec and using it to, to be able to now say, you know what, I want something else. So we're adding, pro we're uh, changing, pro not changing, we're adding to the profiles, we're adding properties, and we're doing this especially in Windows 8. So, um, you know, I, I keep saying server, to, server 2012, can't really speak to it, but there's a lot of new things coming out in 2012. Validation. So that test harness, like I mentioned before, is available to all partners. They do this, they do this so they can test functionality at scale. And uh, we're actually working with all these partners as well to produce the best practices document. Now, the, the purpose of that document is so that when you get it in your hands, and X, IBM XIV is the first one to produce a document like this. When you get this in your hands, what we want to make sure is that you can deploy the exact same configuration, get the exact same results, so that there is no guessing work. There's no, so there's no chance that you're finding a bug for us. That's the last thing we want you to do. So if you've seen my presentation before, we had a smaller list of supported providers, and so uh, the list has grown, and uh, this is not the, the complete list, okay? What I do wanna hear from you guys is what's not on this list. Maybe I, some I can confirm if they're uh, working with us or not. Others, I just wanna hear the name, and uh, maybe some of them, I think, are actually at this conference, so I've already had a few emails back and forth. Yes? Uh, so, no, the, right now the left hand are not supported, but we're working with them. Uh, I, wish I, can, I wish I could just get away from that question. Unfortunately, no. Uh, we're working with the team as well. We're deeply engaged with them. I, I totally understand. It, it doesn't look good. I understand that. But uh, at this point, no support in 2012. RTM. Yes? Equalogic. Equalogic. Uh, we are working with Dell, but at this point, it's not on the list. Yep. Uh, accuracy? Yes. So the question is if with uh, multiple arrays in the environment, can I use a common code base to uh, work against all of these providers? The answer is yes. And that's what we've proven time and time again with, with the test harness and our UI and all of the validation and testing we've done with the plug fest. Yep. Ziotech, we've uh, had a conversation with them, but not at this point, there's no, no support. Yeah, three parts in the list. Yeah, so the, yeah, obviously I had to put in the, the, the model numbers, but I also put the, 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 the branded name as well. 
Okay, yes. The, so the P6000 has been rebranded as the EVA, so the, we've tested on the 8400 and a few others, so yes. Yes, definitely. Um, soon. So, so with, with Hitachi, we're actually working with their development team and their engineering team. And so uh, we're just working through a few performance issues right now, but it's in progress. I, I don't have a timeline, unfortunately, so otherwise I would definitely put it up. Absolutely. Less, less, definitely less. Sorry, one more time. So the question, so the question here is, what's the difference between having an available provider and having that one that's validated? So what we found over the past, uh, past for, for the while that we've been working with SMIS, is that. Um, until VMM came along and actually started stressing and working with these providers, um, they're, they're, you know, they were missing a few things that we needed, right? And so um, we can't just, if, if we can't say right now that if you have an SMS provider, it just works. We do have to engage with the partner, we do give them a test harness, and then we work with them through any bugs or issues and, and all of that. So at this point, I can't say um, that if you just let, so SNEA SMI has lab, has a, a test called CTP, the conformance test. And at this point, I, I, I'm, there is no test that covers all of the VMM scenarios, right? So at, you know, we're working with SMI, actually they're in uh, booth 607 at PlugFest, I mean at MMS uh, this week, and uh, we're working with them to see how we can get CTP up to a point where if we just say, the part, if the partner passes CTP whatever version, then at least base functionality will work. Scale is a different story, That's, they still have to come through us, because the CTP test won't test at scale the way we do. But at least functionality, I want to get it to at that point. So yes. But not, not today. We do work, we have to work with them in, engaged hand in hand. Yep. Okay, so the comment is around what I've shown today is more of specific workflows and you want to see more of an end-to-end -end experience? Like what? How to provision A? Oh, the network. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we do have some, you know, zero to cluster uh, session uh, as well, but it's good feedback. I don't think any of our sessions actually have an orchestrator workflow executing an end-to-end. -end. You know, we, we do show the underlying capabilities that you can then put together into a workflow, but that's good feedback. So we're wrapping up. I do want to um, um, make sure that you guys know that SNEA SMI is at, uh, at MMS. They, uh, we secured them a booth, and so uh, they are in booth 607. So I highly recommend that you go and visit them. Uh, these are the guys that are there, Jim, Troy, Peter, Richard, and James. And so they are ready and willing to answer any questions. Yes, sir. So in 2012 RTM, there is none. So we would expect that the zone be created beforehand. So we're working on it, but not in this release. It, it just came down to time and resources. Because we, we'd have to integrate with the SMS providers on that side. It, it just, we, just it. we just didn't have the time. Yep. Yes, sir. Yes. Agree. You can use Orchestrator for that. Sorry, for the question was around uh, fabric, fabric provisioning. All right, so don't leave just yet. I'm not done. But anyways, um, I'm almost done. So I want to highlight here the, the fact that all of these capabilities in VMM do match up to a private cloud-ready platf cloud platform. And so all of these capabilities are available to you in VMM, obviously available that you can uh, enhance with a workflow. And how these match up to our long-term goals around breakthrough insight, storage on your terms, and ease of use. Okay? So again, this is for your reference so that when you go and have your conversations internally with your IT IT groups with your managers and have that cross conversation with the storage group. You know, you can start showing the value add that this brings to your environment and why you want to integrate with storage. So for Windows 8, this, this, this piece is public information, so I don't, I'm, I'm sharing it today. So this is a sneak peek into what we're doing with Windows 8. Windows 8 introduces a new API, API called the Storage Management API. This API service is now native in Windows and has all of the capabilities that we, I've been using in VMM are now native in the platform. You can actually do it today with beta. 
you can actually look at all, at all these APIs. In fact, if you go to the feature list, there's something called the Standards Based Storage Management Service. And that is the service that we shipped in VM in 2012 is now inbox and Windows. Enhanced and changed and modified, you know, all that. It's now, it's now part of Windows. So instead of us shipping that, uh, that component, if you can see on the top of there, if System Center will sit on top of this new API when we, in our next release, the, the Win 8 release. Oh, sorry, Windows Server 2012 release. Now, what does this give us? It gives us two powerful capabilities. Number one, first, uh, we start with SMIS providers. Every provider that we have today continues to work. So for all of our partners and for all of you that are going to start building on top of VMN 2012, and especially uh, higher-end workflows, those providers, those scripts will just continue to work. We don't expect to make any breaking changes in our, AP, in our commandlets, and hopefully we won't. If we have to, we'll obviously mention it, and we'll blog about it, and we'll put it in our documentation. We'll make sure that you know. But there should be no breaking changes in our commandlet service. And from the underlying provider, it's the same service as being used to talk to the providers. So all those providers continue to work. So that full investment that we've made for the past three years just shifts over to Windows 8. Okay, so that's, that's one of the advantages. Two, we open up our, uh, serv our API service to, to another provider type introduced by Windows uh, Server 2012 called SMP. So this is another provider type that partners can use to plug in if, um, if, if they choose to. Finally, the storage spaces. For, for those that have, had, have heard of storage spaces, this same API service is what actually gives us access to storage spaces. Create LUN, create pool, delete LUN, delete pool, et cetera. Yes, sir? So the question is around what, what are, so we've been talking a lot about provisioning and configuration of storage. What are we doing on the reporting side, show back side, charge back side, right? So there are some reports that we produced for 2012 that actually go through the OM, OM, our OM integration, where we pull in data from VMM into Operations Manager, and then we're able to present some reports. So we do have those for capacity, for trending as well, for how you're trending over time and when you, you, may, you might need to do the next step function of producing, uh, creating a new array, or sorry, purchasing a new array. So we do have those reports available as part of 2012. And so your feedback would be to us is just tell us what's missing in those reports, what else you would like to see. But I don't have any screenshots of those here. That's good feedback that I can add to these as well. But thank you. Um, the other piece of this API is what's called pass-through. Now, one of the reasons why uh, we, were, uh, we went down the path of SMIS three, two or three years ago uh, was because VDS wasn't enough. We, we, we already knew our roadmap moving forward. And so we knew that VDS would never cover the things that we want to do. Think Hyper-V SMB 2.2, think Synthetic Fiber Channel, all right? And so uh, VDS would never do that, and we'd be locked to the Windows, life, to the Windows release cycle. So when, we, uh, when the service became part of Windows, we also asked for this pass-through extension layer. So as part of SMAPI, we have the ability to do get instance, invoke method, and enumerate. Those three, command, those three WMI APIs and a few others actually now give us direct access to the provider. So that provider doesn't have to be blocked, doesn't have to be an array. Could be a NAS device, could be a fiber channel switch provider. So it allows us to innovate beyond the platform without having to wait for the platform to rev. So in Windows, in, in the 2012 release of Windows Server, that API is available to VMM. File Server uses the left hand of that API. They don't use a pass-through. VMM will be using a pass-through. Any third-party application, any third-party script can also leverage this API. It's not, it's, not a pub, it's not a private API. Fully public, fully documented, available in Windows. All right? Here's a list of sessions. Uh, when you go home and look up your sessions, there's a lot of, some recommendations that I have for you. And I do want to make one, um, one community announcement. There's a book being authored by a few MVPs that are in the room here today. And uh, as a fellow author, I, um, I understand the effort that it goes into writing a book, so I want to make sure that these guys get recognition as far as building up the community, especially in private cloud. So uh, Aiden, Hans, Patrick, and Damien, some of them are actually here today. I do want to say congratulations and thank you for being part of this. So, um, you know, that's one thing. So I want to make sure that you guys fill out your surveys, your session evaluation, and, um, you know, everything's going to be accessed online and available online. 
And I really thank you for your time, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of MMS. Thank you.